tonight. We recognized very early in the pandemic that there was just a paucity of information. People were learning, trying to learn very quickly about this new virus and what it was causing and how to best treat patients. An ABC 27 special presentation. We have a series for nursing homes to help them better handle the pandemic. COVID-19 Research and You, sponsored by Penn State College of Medicine. Good evening, I'm Deborah Pinkerton. Research is essential when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, you'll find out how Penn State College of Medicine Research is helping the global fight against COVID-19 misinformation and misunderstanding. Also, we'll learn how Project ECHO is helping people in your community get the high quality care you need and learn how researchers conducted a survey to find out how people want to receive the latest updates about the pandemic. Also, viewers have submitted questions in advance. Denise McCracken is standing by with more. Hi, Denise. Hi, Deborah. Yes, tonight, Dr. Leslie Parent will answer questions about research and clinical trials and find out how you can get involved with a clinical trial and how it makes a difference. We'll be back later in the show to share the questions with you, Deborah. Thanks, Denise. Penn State College of Medicine is involved in a community outreach program that educates fellow doctors and specialists in rural locations, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the country. It's called Project ECHO. Take a look. I practice in a health professional shortage area, which is a area of the country where there is a very high ratio of patients to physicians and other healthcare providers, meaning that there's literally not enough physicians to go around. Dr. James Hayden provides care to residents in Huntington County. One of our facilities, uh, actually, actually multiple of our facilities, are a half hour to 45 minutes from our local hospital. Our local hospital is 50 minutes from nearest hospitals in any direction. This is where Project ECHO comes into play. It's a virtual education program for rural health care providers. Penn State College of Medicine first introduced it in 2018. The goal is really to leverage all of the wonderful expertise that we have at our academic medical center, uh, both our physicians as well of all, as all of the ancillary healthcare staff that we're so fortunate to have in this setting. And we use this platform to train primary care providers uh, at rural clinics or underserved clinics in how to disseminate the best practices for medical advancement. I link up on a weekly or every other weekly basis to present cases to my peers and specialists that are discussed and used as educational tools. And I can bring the treatment for that case as well as the other education back to my community. We typically focus on chronic disease conditions in areas where primary care doctors could use more support. Our first program that we started was actually addressing opioid use disorder and using medication assisted treatment for that. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, Project ECHO's focus shifted. We recognized very early in the pandemic that there was just uh, a, a paucity of information. People were learning, trying to learn very quickly about this new virus and what it was causing and how to best treat patients. And the best way to share that knowledge is really to get it out there as quickly as possible. And so we use the ECHO model a little differently and did our best to help to disseminate medical knowledge across medical specialists. Penn State College of Medicine's Project ECHO program was the first in the nation to launch a COVID-19 series aimed at reaching all communities. That really allowed us to pick up um, a following, uh, not only in Pennsylvania, but we had participants from 30 different states across the country and six different countries around the world join in for our COVID echoes. We developed a series of um, Spanish sessions to reach the Hispanic groups in Central PA, and we also developed some sessions in Nepalese language. So we were able to connect with these minority groups in their own language and educate as the information and the knowledge of, of COVID-19 evolve over time. 
Currently, Project ECHO is focused on areas that need help the most. We have a series for nursing homes to help them better handle the pandemic. Obviously, nursing homes have been very, very hard hit with this pandemic. Their patients, uh, their residents, their, their staff as well. And so we have that ongoing series. Another area is educating the public about the importance of the COVID-19 vaccine. We have been putting billboards promoting the, 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 the vaccination. We're putting social media content, public health service an announcement. And we're doing some other um, in-person activities as we are able to do them um, to really answer those questions, address those concerns and motivate people to get to get the vaccine. Communication that's impacting people not only in the mid-state, but around the world. Our sessions were not only uh, watched by people from Central PA, we have people joining from Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Puerto Rico. So our own information, as, as the pandemic evolved, we were able to educate not only our own communities, but also reaching many, many countries. And that was another great contribution that we did as well. We're lucky enough that Project ECHO was always a telehealth approach. So we like to say we were on Zoom before Zoom was cool. And speaking of Zoom, joining us is Dr. Jennifer Krasniewski, Professor and Vice Chair for Research for the Department of Medicine and Director for Penn State Project ECHO. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me tonight. In Pennsylvania, COVID-19 deaths were being reported at a staggering rate in nursing home facilities throughout the pandemic. As you had mentioned, Project ECHO responded. How's it going? So it's going well, thanks, thanks for that. Um, right from the beginning of the pandemic, we recognized that nursing homes were high need. And so we got started. We started a pilot series with the nursing homes that created a platform for them to share the questions and concerns they had and to talk through those answers with our Penn State experts. We were able to partner with the Department of Health sponsored regional response program, which Penn State led for the South Central region. And this gave us pilot data that we've actually uh, been able to leverage to turn into an externally funded grant from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. So we're currently studying the impact of ECHO in a randomized controlled trial. The nursing homes tell us that it's been incredibly helpful to them to have this forum. Um, they appreciate knowing that they're not alone in this and that they're facing the same struggles that others are. And they appreciate hearing from the experts in the field. Oh, that's certainly wonderful news. Now, you've also hosted town meetings related to COVID education, vaccine education. One event had more than 700 attendees. That's incredible. How did the community benefit from that event? So Project ECHO was designed to be a training platform for healthcare workers. However, we realized we could pivot and help meet the needs of the community. And so we've really been able to have these extra platforms on COVID itself and the vaccination to address the many questions that our community has coming from trusted Penn State doctors and researchers. So we can address any misunderstandings and provide them the latest in the evidence base. Wow. And tell us what's next for Project ECHO and your COVID projects. I'd like to think that on Project ECHO, we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we know that the pandemic has many downsides and there's increasing rates of mental health conditions and unfortunately also of substance use disorders. And there's not enough of these specialists to take care of all the patients who have these needs. So we're fortunate to have all of these wonderful specialists at Penn State, and we're having them help us through Project ECHO to train primary care doctors in the community so that they can increase their skills in treating patients with these conditions and help everyone be healthier. And like you said, you knew Zoom before we knew Zoom. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's wonderful for the platform to be used more widely. Um, and I'm just thrilled that we have this here in Central PA to help meet the needs of our community. Dr. Krasniewski, thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. For more information about Penn State Health or if you would like to schedule an appointment with a physician, call 866-222-6012. And if you would like to find out about the clinical trials, and how you can get involved, go to studyfinder.org. Let's check in now with Denise McCracken for the answers to some viewer questions we received. Denise? 
Thanks, Deborah. Well, here to answer those questions is Dr. Leslie Parent. She's Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at Penn State College of Medicine. Doctor, this viewer asks, are you working on research related to the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, yes, actually we are. We have several COVID uh, vaccine studies that are in the final stages of approval. One involves how best to give the vaccine to people with a history of severe allergies. And another is a study on vaccinations in pregnant women. We really need to understand more about the vaccine in pregnancy. We look forward to sharing more about these clinical trials when they're open and accepting volunteers. We also have scientists who are working on a novel vaccine that could prevent COVID-19 and related coronaviruses that could affect us in the future. It's important to recognize that although COVID-19 is new, scientists have been working on vaccines for many years, including the types of vaccines that are currently being used in the US. These results have shown that the authorized COVID vaccines are extremely good at protecting people from becoming seriously ill or dying, including the elderly and those at high risk for poor outcomes. The seeing the vaccine distri being distributed across the country is very exciting. However, it's important that everyone continues to follow CDC guidance on social distancing, wearing masks and hand washing until enough people are protected from becoming infected. And we do have another viewer question. This one is related to changes in guidance. Why does safety guidance keep changing throughout the pandemic? Yes, I realize that changing guidance can be very confusing, but it's important to remember that we really had no previous experience with this virus until over a, a little over a year ago. So we're learning about it in real time. That means we have to adjust the recommendations as more information becomes available about how it spreads, the type of symptoms people develop, and how to prevent transmission. As physicians and scientists, we recognize that as more data are collected, the findings from our research studies can change recommendations for public health guidance and medical treatments. The public has witnessed the scientific method play out day to day throughout the pandemic. And that's why it may seem like guidance from public health officials has changed over many times during the past year. But sometimes we have to change what we're doing if the evidence tells us that's not right anymore. So I encourage everyone to be flexible and have an open mind as we continue to navigate the pandemic and make these discoveries together. And our last viewer question this evening, what's next for research? You know, a really important problem uh, that needs attention is helping people who have long-term problems from COVID infection, which some people have referred to as long COVID. Our researchers are looking at ways we can partner with other hospitals and universities around the country to study the long-term effects of COVID through our nationally funded Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. So while COVID will continue to be important, other health problems need attention too. And because we need to offer clinical trials to people with heart disease, cancer, and other diseases, we never stop giving people access to therapeutic clinical trials. We did, however, have to change the way we did clinical research by creating increased safety protocols to make sure that the process was as safe as possible. We are incredibly grateful to our community volunteers and our patients who have helped us develop new ways to treat disease by participating in research. And as was said earlier, if you are interested in participating in a clinical trial, please go to studyfinder.psu.edu. Dr. Parent, thank you so much for all of that great information. Thanks also for joining us this evening. Thank you. And as we mentioned earlier, for more information about Penn State Health, or if you would like to schedule an appointment with any physician, call 866-222-6012. If you would like to find out more about the clinical trials and how you can get involved, go to studyfinder.org. Stay with us, we'll be right back. This is Krista's happy place. This is Krista's warmth. This is Krista's heart and soul. This is Krista being a mom after cancer. This is Penn State Cancer Institute. This is how we restore hope. This is how we protect what matters. 
This is how we preserve what's familiar. This is why we're always researching, learning, and innovating. This is the health we need to live the way we want. This is Penn State Health. You're watching COVID-19 Research and You on ABC 27, sponsored by Penn State College of Medicine. Welcome back. Joining us is Dr. Robert Lennon, Associate Professor with the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and Dr. Lauren Van Scoy, Associate Professor with the Department of Medicine, Humanities, and Public Health Services. Thank you for being with us both. Both of us being with us, I should say. Dr. Lennon, what inspired you to start the COVID-19 Communication Research Study, and what did you learn? Well, understanding health messaging is important in pandemics to make sure the public knows what they can do to protect themselves and the value and safety of treatments and vaccines. So we were inspired to help our community by seeking to understand COVID-19 messaging, what people understood about the virus, where they got their information and whether they intended to do things like socially distance. Also, the COVID pandemic was the first time in human history where virtually every human on the planet not only faced a catastrophic disease, but knew about it at the same time and this offered an unprecedented opportunity to study how different cultures face this kind of threat, potentially giving significant insights into core differences in cultural values. And that's why we expanded our survey globally. Dr. Van Scoy, why don't you talk to us about the survey and the types of questions you ask participants? Yeah, we had so many questions. It was very hard to design a survey and know how best to do it. So we decided that we would address um, several aspects of the crisis as it was emerging. And we did so using both closed-ended questions and open-ended questions where people could free text in their responses, sort of like an essay. Um, and so we asked some questions about COVID knowledge using true or false style questions from CDC basic information. Um, and then we asked people how confident they were in their answers. We asked people whether they intended to comply with the health recommendations from CDC at the time, which was, you know, hand washing and social distancing, masks weren't, um, had evolved later. Uh, and we also just simply asked what worries you the most about COVID-19 and got some really interesting answers. And then finally, we went to uh, talk a little bit about information sources to learn where people were getting their information and what they thought about the information they were receiving. Yeah, those are certainly great questions to ask. Dr. Lennon, we know this survey was distributed globally. Can you tell us about the results right from our home state here in Pennsylvania? Well, right off the bat, we learned that people really wanted to share their experiences about COVID. So many people responded that we briefly shut down our computer network. We learned that Pennsylvanians had a really good understanding of COVID-19 and most intended to follow public health recommendations. We also found that COVID has changed health information sources. Historically, television news has been the number one source of health news for people in America. In COVID, it was government websites by a wide margin. We also found a relationship between trusted news source and knowledge. Those whose trusted source was government websites had higher knowledge. Those who got any news from Facebook had lower knowledge. And we found that people really valued local television news over and over in free text responses. We had participants tell us they didn't trust national conglomerate news and that they highly valued local news. Many people free texted ABC 27 as their trusted news source. They mentioned your coronavirus webpage. And my favorite quote was uh, from a person who wrote in that quote, I really like Penn State Hershey Med having coronavirus programs that are on ABC 27. Wow, that is great to hear. I know that we certainly tried to get out as much information and be as accurate as possible. Dr. Van Scoy, why don't you talk to us about your biggest takeaways from this research? Yeah, so, you know, some of the most powerful and interesting insights that we learned in the study were how people were perceiving the messaging from the government, the national media, the local media around the pandemic. And it was clear really early on that politics was playing a major role in, in the way people were um, interpreting the information. Um, and even though we were really careful not to include politics and you know political questions in our survey, our responses were just filled with politicization concerns, sensationalism concerns um, about national media and a whole host of other sort of negative emotions. 
Um, and we, we found when we analyzed the data, this uh, clear relationship between concerns about politicization, sensationalization, and leading to you know, confusion, distrust, and then generalized anxiety. Uh, and so the extent to which I think these ideas, this, this, these concerns seeped into our data uh, was really surprising to us because our survey was supposed to be about health recommendations. Um, and so at the time, it was very surprising how political it was. Wow, that's very interesting. Dr. Lennon, we are learning more and more about how communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the virus. What did you learn about communities of color in your survey? Well, between the Pennsylvania survey and the global survey, we found that vaccine confidence is low among non-whites. And for African-Americans, this appears to be primarily a function of trust. In particular, trust in the safety of vaccine development. So historically, vaccine campaigns focused on the threat of disease or a need to trust public health officials. Our data shows that for COVID vaccination campaigns, especially in communities of color, we have to be able to demonstrate the safety of vaccines and the safety and rigor of the research and development of the vaccines. Now, why don't we talk about some of the global results from the survey? Well, we found some differences in knowledge and intent to comply between countries, mostly related to cultural differences and how information is consumed and normative behaviors. But what really stood out across countries and languages and cultures was a resounding commonality of concern for fellow human beings. Given the devastation of COVID and the political nature of the pandemic, we found it very inspiring to see that the differences we see in each other pale in comparison to our shared humanity expressed through our universal intrinsic compassion for others. Yeah, everyone's sort of pulling together and trying to fight this pandemic together. Dr. Lennon, what can we learn from, or what can you learn from your research going forward? Well, we really saw the value of having a medical center in our backyard. Our work was a global effort, but we started in the six counties around Hershey. So before anyone else, we had information on how to communicate with patients and how to manage our outreach efforts through the media. And we saw this in much lower mortality rates. So Hershey Medical Center is an Ebola treatment center. So we're well suited to pandemic scale outbreaks. And that explains in part why our inpatient mortality rates for COVID were 93% lower than comparable institutions across the country. And we definitely learned that a close relationship between medical science, local media and community leaders makes all the difference in early pandemic response. Okay, Dr. Lennon, Dr. Van Skoy, lots of really good information, thank you. Thank you. And for more information about Penn State Health, or if you would like to schedule an appointment with a physician, call 866-222-6012. And if you would like to find out more about the clinical trials and how you can get involved, go to studyfinder.psu.edu. And back with us right now is Dr. Leslie Parent, Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at the Penn State College of Medicine. Thanks for being with us again to answer some more questions. In addition to the research shown in the previous segments, Penn State Health and Penn State College of Medicine were part of important clinical trials to help and potentially find treatments for COVID-19. Talk to us about that. Yes, thanks, I'd be happy to. So in March of last year, we were approved as one of the first 100 hospitals in the world to take part in a clinical trial to test a new antiviral medicine called remdesivir. This was our first randomized placebo controlled trial for the treatment of COVID-19, and it led to remdesivir being authorized for treatment by the FDA. We've now been involved in four versions of this trial so far that have tested different drug combinations and have resulted in new recommended treatment options available to patients. Using placebo controlled trials to rigorously test drugs for this new disease was really very important. We needed to find out what did and what didn't work so we could help people with COVID-19 recover and be discharged from the hospital more quickly. The data from the Penn State Health patients treated at the Hershey Medical Center was included in the published results for this international trial which led to the new recommendations by the FDA and other organizations to treat patients with severe COVID-19. One of the main reasons we are here tonight is to show the community the benefit of having an academic medical center right here in our own backyard. Can you tell us why it's so important, especially now during a pandemic? Yes, as an academic medical center, we are set up to do research and we were really prepared to launch these groundbreaking studies very rapidly. 
And it allowed us to offer leading edge therapies to patients right here in central Pennsylvania during this pandemic. Many of our faculty and our research team shifted their focus to COVID-19 in early 2020. And since then, we've had over 110 COVID-related projects in process or submitted for funding. Some of these projects have a really immediate impact, like the clinical trials and the research that you heard about in today's show, while others have the potential for more long-term benefits because finding new treatments for coronavirus infections may take longer to develop and test. So even though we may not see the outcomes of these experiments for months or years, this won't be the last pandemic that we'll face. So we really need to be thinking ahead. Our access to partners at our university in Pennsylvania, in the health system and across the country made these projects possible and allows us to give our patients the help they need now and in the future. And can you talk to us about some of the projects on a local and also national level? Yes, early in the pandemic, you'll remember there was a lot of uncertainty about whether we would have enough supplies to protect healthcare workers and support patients with severe disease. So in response to that urgent need, we partners with colleagues at University Park in engineering and business and formed a group of hundreds of people who designed and delivered rapid solutions for masks, face shields, disinfectants, and parts for ventilators. Our connections to the university helped us to create an all hands on deck approach to address shortages and medical supplies that were needed for the pandemic. And now there's a lot of concern about SARS-CoV-2 variants around the world and locally as well. So we're beginning to interact with partners like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and scientists from the Big Ten to monitor COVID-19 variants to learn about their impact on disease severity, disease spread, and the immune response. This collaborative spirit of working together to solve difficult problems has been a, a, a hallmark of this pandemic and a real win for science. Great. Dr. Parent, lots of really good information. Thank you for joining us tonight. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much. And we want to thank you, our viewers, for sending in your questions. We also send a special thanks to all of the healthcare employees who are working during this pandemic. For more information about Penn State Health, or if you would like to schedule an appointment with a physician, call this number 866-222-6012. And if you would like to find out more about the clinical trials and how you can get involved, go to studyfinder.psu.edu. We want to thank you for watching this evening. We wish you good health.